About my background, I'm a radio and TV journalist, but during the last 10 years, I worked mainly in corporate communication and media training. And I'm the managing director of Constructify Media, an NGO founded three years ago to promote constructive journalism, especially in the area of water, climate and environment. And we are a group of experienced journalists and environmental scientists. Yeah, and how did I got to know of constructive journalism? Actually, that was during my time some years ago when I used to be the head of PR of a Bremen-based NGO called BORDA, which is internationally active in the water and sanitation sector. And we made several um, workshops with media people all over the world. And during that time, I learned from the concept of constructive journalism. And then in beginning of 2019, I attended the second global journalism conference, constructive journalism conference in Geneva, which was opened at that time by the UN uh, Vice Secretary General in Geneva. So that was really a big event with about 500 people and very inspiring that you could see that's a kind of new vision for journalism and can really give new answers to journalism. So, and uh, what's behind constructive journalism? I think at the very beginning, there was a book, not from a journalist, but from a doctor in medicine who is from, or he used to be from Sweden. He passed away some years ago, Hans Rosling, and perhaps some of you might know his book, Factfulness. And um, yeah, he had a lot of experience in Africa. He worked for the um, WHO, for the World Health Organization, and... Um, when he came back to Sweden and held lessons at the university and lectures, then he discovered that uh, yeah, the perception of what happening, what's happening in the world, even amongst academics, it's much worse than uh, the reality is. And then he decided to write this book where he really added so many facts uh, which are proving that things are different, different than many people believing. And I think what's behind that is um, that media influencing are our perception of the world. And uh, they are very often very negative, very often focusing on conflicts and crises. And that gives a negative bias and uh, let's say an, a misleading picture of reality. And um, yeah, his uh, heritage is, let's say, um, yeah, continued by his son, um, and he founded an um, institute called gapminder.org. So I think that's really a um, very useful tool. And um, I would like you to, um, they, they prepare that kind of questions and so on. So they have a lot of uh, questionnaires and also um, charts which they use for um, practical use. And uh, yeah, I would like you to answer this question here in the chat so that we can see how many of you have the right answer. So please go ahead and write something in the chat. Do you believe um, 92A uh, is that uh, are um, adopting the Paris Agreement or B142 or C192? So please. There are already some numbers, so please go ahead and write. Still waiting for a moment. But don't check in internet, please <laughs> write your own um, opinion. Okay, I go ahead and I must admit um, you are better than the average I wrote here wrong. But the truth is uh, most of you who wrote something in wrote 192 and that's absolutely correct. But um, as you can see here, here on that slide, um, that's a typical misconception and misunderstanding. So most people, 
two percent believe it's much less um, uh, countries who are committed to climate change uh, adoption, at least on paper, as they are writing here. But I think that's an important fact that uh, commitment also um, yeah, explains something or illustrates at least the will to change something. Yeah, who is behind um, constructive journalism? The founders were um, Ulrich Hagerup from uh, Denmark and also from Denmark, Katrin Güldenstedt. Both worked at the Danish uh, National Radio and um, about 10 years ago, they were really frustrated from, um, let's say, the negative bias of the news in their radio station. And um, yeah, Ulrich Hagerup made a very nice, um, what means nice, a very interesting table of headlines from one kind of random uh, radio show where uh, he had the headlines of 10 news and all of them were starting with... Uh, crisis, conflict, uh, corruption, or whatever. And then at the very end, um, and now to the weather, and it will rain tomorrow. So that's something what is very typical for our news. They give you really a very, very negative view on the media. And um, that's very good analyzed uh, in his book, Constructive News. And um, so he describes on the one hand, the state of the news, and the state of the media and also gives um, develops a concept of constructive journalism and um, as most of you may know is um, there are these typical um, approaches bad news is good news or when it bleeds it leads and that uh, it's let's say more or less the mainstream approach of media um okay so and um yeah, behind that, there's a kind of journalistic theory of change that media or journalists believe if they are whistleblowers or if they are exposing wrongdoing, if they're pointing out social problems, then the audience will be kind of convinced and that will eventually lead to reform. But uh, I think as um, um, in the meantime, um, yeah, studies and research prove that's not true. So um, there's, in the meantime, I think since about 10 years, there are regular um, studies from the famous Reuters um, Institute in London, uh, which uh, um, are conducting the digital news report. And the newest one says that worldwide, globally, 36% uh, of people and of audience of News consumers avoid news due to the due to the negative bias of the media, and uh, that's just an average. In some countries, it's even much much higher. In other countries, like for example Germany, I think it's uh, partly less. But it illustrates that uh, people are somehow frustrated, or they can't bear that psychologically anymore. So they are try to avoid news. And um, constructive journalism tries to, um, yeah, to overcome that, not in the way that uh, constructive journalism will do, like positive journalism, that uh, we are not painting a pink picture of reality. We try to give a realistic picture of reality, but then also ask the questions for the future. What now? What can we change? Who are people who are searching for solutions? Are they appearing in our reports, in our stories? And are there solutions available? So um, are there, for example, best practice examples which can be shown by media and by journalists? And I think that's a really important point. And um, yeah, here very briefly, you, you see an overview on um, or comparison, what means breaking news in investigative journalism against constructive journalism. And um, I mean, constructive journalism doesn't deny um, breaking news or investigative journalism, but it's always a kind of add on. So it tries to think about the future, asking what now, looking for solutions and best practice. And it's 
um, very important. It's also a kind of inspiration. So later on, we can provide you this um, um, slides so you can uh, also follow them later on. Yeah, what uh, means constructive reporting uh, with respect to climate change? I would like to give you an example what, uh, from my point of view, is very typical for that negative bias of um, mainstream media. BBC published a report on um, water crisis in uh, Central Asia, particularly in Uzbekistan. It's already some years ago. And that was a very interesting article. I think it was about four pages. It was uh, published on the online um, portal of the BBC. And they described really in detail what kind of prep problems um, um, Uzbekistan and the four neighboring countries are facing in terms of uh, water issues. And of course, you may know they have this um, famous um, Ara Lake there, which has really um, disaster behind it. I think perhaps one of the biggest natural disasters. But in the meantime, there are also already, uh, already many relief measures in that area. So everything was, was described rightly and correctly, but without anything mentioning what is done to overcome that. And instead of it, there was this quote of an um, analyst or a scientist saying the most optimistic scenario is that things stay as they are. And I think that's um, devastating for readers because um, they would see, uh, let's say, a pretty catastrophic picture of environmental issues in that region. And um, what they learn is the best thing, everything would stay as it is. And that's definitely not the truth. And um, for example, in that area, National Geographic, at least in the education block, um, was writing that uh, the Aral Lake and the Aral Sea is really getting um, a better future in the meantime. And uh, as I know from our own work at Border at that time, there is a great Blue Peace initiative. We all know political initiatives doesn't mean that reality is already changed, but at least that shows a way and a path where to go. And um, several and many of these projects are on the way to be implemented. So that's what we mean with constructive journalism. You all, all also have to show and to illustrate what is done and um, what kind of solutions can be found uh, to overcome climate or environmental problems. And uh, some or other aspect related a bit more to Africa. There is, for example, um, climate action where many um, cities are following um, the city's race to zero, zero. And for example, in South Africa, Bremen's partner city Durban is involved and very, very active in that sector and is really doing something. Where do you read that? And is that enough reported? And then um, about best practice examples, that's a very new one. It's from a Nigerian um, uh, media portal, Prime Progress. And uh, it's reporting about um, efforts in um, Kenya. And I think that's a typical constructive story showing ways how to, for example, how to overcome uh, food problems or how to, um, um, to get people involved into climate action. And uh, that's a very new example. It's from yesterday from that uh, um, magazine. And um, sorry, I sometimes have problems here to continue. And one another aspect I want to mention in that context is also about storytelling. Um, so, um, I mean, that's kind of um, journalistic work. It's not only related to climate uh, or a constructive journalism, but it's also important for a constructive and climate jo journalism. And that means, for example, we have to translate scientific research into really attractive stories with uh, which we can 
catch our audience. And very often you have a lot of material from scientists, but then you have to bring it in the form and to con convey the messages which are digestible for the audience. And I think that's a really big challenge, uh, particularly in the um, context of climate journalism. Then um, what helps in that context is always if you have a kind of protagonists, people who can help to make facts understandable. So that's very important if you are um, working on the climate story, try to identify who might be a really useful protagonist for that story and really take your time to ident identify the right persons for that. Another aspect, I think um, it's a very basic journalistic aspect, but very important here, go to the spot, feel the atmosphere, and really um, understand what's um, going on on the ground and don't rely only on facts and figures. And also important in that context, of course, be close to, the, close to people. So that's, uh, I think, always kind of criteria also for constructive and solutions-oriented journalism. Yeah, when we founded our association, we asked ourselves, is there a right on information to, to get the, let's say, sufficient or the right information about climate change and also about solutions? And we did a lot of research on that. And... Uh, we found that uh, there's on the one hand um, the sustainable development goals. And of course, that's not a kind of binding um, legal network or international law, but it's a very strong international commitment of the international community passed by the United Nations General Assembly. And that clearly outlines a way how we can change the world in a sustainable sustainable way, how we can develop the world and what is needed to be done. So that's uh, pretty precisely defined here. And uh, so far, it's not only, let's say, a critical reception of the status quo. It's also or mainly a tool to show how we can find solutions for all these 17 um, urgent issues. And um, yeah, one thing which was from our uh, point of view, perhaps one of the most important aspects, there was a meeting of um, yeah, famous lawyers and uh, legal experts who are not directly now representatives of uh, their countries, but they used to be uh, in that sector for a long time. And they met in 2015 in Oslo. And uh, so that uh, they developed their the so-called Oslo principles on global global climate change obligations. And uh, what we found important for us is that they really defined there should be guarantees of public access to information about the climate effects of policies, projects, and practices. So very practically uh, speaking, that means, for example, from our point of view, that uh, the farmer in Kenya who suffers from drought or so he should know what is, or he at least he should get the opportunity to know um, why is that the case and what kind of options, opportunities, solutions are in place to change that. So that's responsibility of the of humankind, of the society, and of course, particularly of media. And uh, as we could see, can see in the meantime. This is, again, not, it's a kind of declaration, but it's not an official de de declaration. But anyhow, it's becoming more and more something which is seen as um, kind of internationally accepted. For example, uh, there was a very famous um, uh, court case at the Supreme Court in Netherlands, the so-called Urgenda case, which was also about climate change. And they referred to that uh, Oslo principles. Yeah, last point, um, what are important networks or stakeholders? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the founders, uh, particularly um, Ulrich Hagerup, he is also president or manager of the Constructive Institute, which is related to the 
um, University of Aarhus in Denmark. And um, let's say they are still the nucleus and the main uh, uh, institution in the field of constructive journalism. And they, they were also co-founder of um, the constructive of the Bonn Institute for Constructive Dialogue and Journalism, which was founded, I think, two or three years ago. And uh, together with some um, big media outlets in Germany and uh, also with the Constructive Institute. And another one is um, the Solutions Journalism Network, which is mainly based in the United States. And I would recommend you here particularly their Solutions Story Tracker. And uh, that's it's a big um, repository for um, solutions-oriented stories. And as you can see, they have in the meantime already more than 15,000 stories. And uh, you can really use that for your purposes to get, let's say, a kind of best practice example or to take it uh, for your own research or whatever. So um, if you give any keyword um, in their search machine, for example, like mangroves, then you will find easily uh, three, four stories of other people who were written um, in a style and then after according to the concept of constructive and solutions-oriented journalism. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there is um, the mainstream media are still, let's say, on another track. But as you can see, after eight, 10 years, um, the constructive journalism is getting more and more support from media all over the world and uh, from, yeah, we believe that's really uh, one of the most important tools for journalism and especially for climate journalism. Yeah, and one of, uh, we are also active in that sector and um, that's our association here. And um, yeah, if that's interesting for you, you can um, go to our website and, um, you can also join our association. We were happy uh, about every new member. So that's my side from the for the beginning and from my side for my beginning. And thank you very much. And um, yeah, I'm open for any questions. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for that wonderful presentation. I know sometimes it's not easy being uh, the one who's starting eh? uh you are allowed to take some uh, glass of water glasses of water actually yeah, yeah. but at the moment uh, i want to well hmm. questions um i want to welcome uh, christoph's presentation uh you feel free to uh feel free to just raise your hand on the um the, the chat box so that i can be able to just uh take a feed uh from you Who's going first? I can't see any hand up yet. Yeah, maybe Chris, as we are as we are waiting for um uh for, for the colleagues to share in their to, 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 to come in with questions, probably um as 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 a, as a probably a communicator and a scientist or a scientific communicator, what has been some of the challenges that you faced uh transitioning from uh you know from uh, just general or generic uh, 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 media uh, work to specific uh, climate uh, work. I had some sound problems, but if I understood you rightly, I think you are you were asking what are the specific challenges, for example, to for scientific research to be conveyed to the yes. public. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. As a as a journalist, yeah. Um. It's interestingly, I'm also an assistant teacher at our university, and I'm uh, just now uh, uh, conducting a seminar together with the Polar Research uh, Project um, at our university. So media students uh, connecting with the uh, researchers. And just last week, we had uh, the head of that research program with us, a biologist. And um, yeah, one thing is, for example, that scientists are in a certain way happy when they don't have a negative result. They are doing research in the <laughs> Arctic. And she said, um, when the, she started 10 years ago with their research at the beginning, she was a kind of disappointed that there was nothing spectacular. 
But um, then she said, okay, it's good for climate. That Then it means uh, there is not, it, it happened that worse as we perhaps expect. And um, that's one aspect. So that they perhaps sometimes uh, doesn't deliver that uh, really strong headlines which can be used for a catchy headline in, in, in the papers or in the media. And the other thing is that they are, um, of course, um, offering um, material which is perhaps not so easy to understand and also the impact. What does it mean exactly? So because they are going in details, talking about uh, micro biological things. And um, so all that has to be translated in something which can be digested by a broader audience and who is, has no scientific or academic uh, background. And that, of course, is always uh, the biggest challenge for journalists. How can we deal with that? And what I always say is um, you have to find a way which is more oriented on the on the persons, on the um, the persons involved, for example. Try then, for example, to portray the, 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 the scientists so that you better understand how they work, for example, and how their work is developing and uh, how the results is, are developing from their work. And um, yeah. yeah, I think um, one last point, um, I believe that we have to be aware that there is not a um, black and white picture of reality. So if you have the chance to, uh, to prepare background uh, articles or films or so, then it's always too important to have a really diverse um, and multi-perspective um, um, approach to the topic. So I think that is also a way how to deal with that. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, I, this is an, okay. I cannot still see any mess, any question, but I have one more question for you, Chris. Eh? Um, you know, cop, cops have been there. I mean, the conference of parties have been there. Now we are going to the 28th one. And probably if you look at the reports that come on the media, there is that negative quotation of um, speak, speech after speech, you know, like a talking conference and um, uh, portraying cops, um, probably post cops as um, no action kind of cops or conferences. conferences. Um, as journalists or as, as journalists, how then do you, be able, uh, do you um, ensure that you track or the um, you track the outcomes and the implementation of the outcomes of cops throughout the year, so that at least when we transition to the next cop, there is substance. Um, in a certain way, I think you you can give some answers to that in your presentation at the end. <laughs> um, um, uh, <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe just that. Uh, we, we we all should keep in mind that there was one uh, very critical issue in the moment that everything is overshadowed uh, through the war in uh, Israel and Palestine in Gaza, so that the media yeah. are, uh, yeah. um, let's say, packed with that. Attention. And then there's also the, the war in the Ukraine. And I think yeah. um, the, the, perhaps the biggest challenge is uh, to bring climate issues all the inter international headlines. And I think that's the most important. Eh? How can we find ways to um, still um, keep that awareness that besides all these wars, there is a really, really burning issue that is climate change. And we have to do something. And we don't need wars for that. So we need to cooperation. And um, perhaps um, there can be also kind of peace message from uh, climate issues. So I think that are issues which have to be in, um, promoted by journalists. So that would be my way to do that. Hmm? Can I have a question for Christoph? Yes. Yes. Sure. Uh, thanks, Christoph, for that uh, superb presentation. It's good. It's an eye opener. And uh, I encourage that, uh, I mean, most of us pick it from there. Now, the question is yeah. uh, what uh, uh, the question is, most of these climate change uh, issues and challenges occur in uh, Africa. Now, what specific programs do you have as uh, experienced journalists who have come together and partnered with uh, uh, many of these international organizations 
to empower uh, journalists, especially in Africa, uh, with the knowledge and skills on how to report uh, climate change positively, specific uh, programs and plans that you have. Thank you. I mean, that's a very good question and perhaps something which we can pick up again at the end in the panel discussion. Um, yes, yes. So, I mean, what we did as our as association, we um, did already similar workshops uh, at the end of the last three years. And then one was, for example, about climate justice. One was about uh, green financing and one was about protecting the oceans. And all of them uh, were somehow dedicated mainly to um, uh, the situation in Africa. So um, we try to, let's say, to pro promote that uh, by our means. And uh, what I could imagine that uh, as one outcome of the seminar that we can find, for example, or establish cooperation with um, media association in um, African countries so that we can try to uh, set up joint projects like, um, for example, a kind of um, non-academic uh, study course on climate journalism which can be uh, organized by us or together with the local media uh, organization in uh, which country or which region in Africa um, it, it will be. So that, from my point of view, for example, or could be a kind of outcome. So that um, I would appreciate that very much and we can really give support to that. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, there is a question. There's a question on the chat, Chris. Uh, I believe it is directed to you. Uh, just one uh, out of curiosity: which location is constructivized picker background picture taken from? It looks like it has a unique climate story. <laughs> Sorry, I have to to read that again. Just of which location is constructivized picker background picture taken from? Ah, good question. Actually, I must admit, we uh, it's from our last seminar um i'm not sure i believe that somewhere in eastern africa but i can't um um yeah i'm not 100% sure about that sorry somebody else from us um, picked that picture or got that picture and um, yeah i don't know is there any other comment for example and saying um okay Good. We have uh, Yasundari yes, from Indonesia having a question. Yasundari, yes, welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, this is really interesting that we talk about the constructive journalism, which is still uh, pretty unknown here in Indonesia. Thank you, Christoph, to introduce this. And I hope we can also collaborate in the future. And my background is a lecturer who studied journalism for my BA back then. And I want to ask you, how can we define the difference between the comprehensive news or the constructive uh, journalism? Or is it uh, the output, is, it's just uh, the same? And for the other question is, how long the is the average of the process for the constructive journalism can be uploaded in the media, especially for the online media? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think there's one important thing if you, I think you should, even if it's, for example, the book of Ulrich Hagerup is called Constructive News. I believe that um, um, constructive journalism is mainly about background journalism and less about news journalism. Because I think it's very difficult if you have was, done was, uh, just one minute or so or half a minute for news, then you can't be constructive. If somebody has been killed by somebody else, then it's always very difficult to say what is the constructive aspect in it. So you can find it only if you go deeper into a story and find uh, what are the reasons for the killing and so on. And then perhaps you can get a kind of a constructive angle. But um, in so far, I think... Uh, it's mainly about um, background information and uh, deeper diving into stories. And uh, you see that uh, wherever it's, um, let's say in that context, the, the articles are mainly 
um, longer articles or half an hour stories in the TV or 20 minute stories or five minute stories, at least in the radio. By the way, The Guardian is very good in that. And um, yeah, the, the second question about adaption, I think it's more like um, um, how can you convince uh, media outlets, uh, the editors and also the journalists um, to stick to the concept? And perhaps uh, there are the experiences differently in um, international countries or in, in uh, different countries. But I know from Germany that there is a there there are many prejudices against um, constructive journalism because uh, journalists um, may say that's a kind of activism. You shouldn't commonize with any action or so, and. Um, which I wouldn't follow. I think, um, of course, um, I shouldn't be, let's say, be in the same time the journalist and the activist. But if I'm reporting on about climate change, then I wouldn't call that um, or describe that at, uh, as um, activism. But that's, for example, one of the prejudices which is mentioned. And um, yeah, I think... Um, at least uh, my generation in Germany, uh, my generation of German journalists were educated as, um, yeah, to be so so called objective, and uh, which is always very difficult to be objective. There's, I don't believe that there's real real uh, objectivity, but uh, that's let's say a general approach, and um, so it's not so easy in Germany to convince. Um, um, media outlets and journalists um, to dedicate themselves to constructive journalism. But I must say, on the other hand, there are some ways, for example, um, Voice of Germany, Deutsche Welle, the international program of the public international uh, German program in TV and radio, they are pretty much con committed to that. And there are other bigger um, radio uh, magazines, for example, or radio channels and also public channels and also some important papers who more and more try to um, go into that direction. But it's definitely a process. Good, 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 good. Thanks for that. I am, we can see a very beautiful comment here from Nelly. Yeah. Or, uh, Nelly, would you want to speak on the, on the microphone? Um, otherwise, I'll read. There is a very beautiful statement here that uh, probably all of us have read um, about the story of, uh, you know, uh, 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 South, South African story, uh, in a podcast of a child, you know, in, in a mind. I mean, Nelly, if you're there, you can be able to, to talk about it. Okay, thank you very much, Kennedy, for the opportunity, and thank you, Christophe, for your presentation. Uh, it just brought, uh, it just reminded me of a podcast I was listening to uh, in South Africa, and there's this plan to close the coal mines, and this story was told through a miner who, uh, before he came into the coal mine, he was a farmer, and he, his land was bought out, and then now he ventured into mining. And now again, there's a plan to close the mines to transition to clean energy and is narrating that story. And the, there's the daughter also is saying how far they have come uh, through looking for money for higher education and everything. But then uh, at the end of the article, what I liked is that he said, yes, I, I was a farmer. I left. I came to be a miner. And now I think it is time to transition to something else. It's time to move on. And the story brought out you know, it, it wasn't just a helpless situation, just pointing to problems and problems and this is going to, going to be closed and what next for us, where will we earn a living? No, it gave the person an opportunity to reflect and also to see how far they've come and that perhaps it's time to move on and look at that uh, closure uh, positively. So uh, this presentation today has just reminded me how impactful or how uh, important our journalism must be so that we it, it's it's a call to action making people make decisions based on what we are packaging and making them reflect on the situation and not uh, really be making it uh, like conflict all the time but there's a way that people are called to action that uh, makes them make uh, come up with solutions to what they are facing. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Nelly, and uh, very happy to hear that. And I think that's really a very critical issue. And uh, we have the same experience in, in Germany when uh, the coal mines have been closed down, or even now there are still some to be closed down, mainly uh, due to climate issues. And then that's always a big uh, controversial debate in the society. And uh, then, for example, very often all the, the social aspects of the uh, workers are uh, coming into the foreground. And um, so then it's very important to, um, as a journalist, to create a context and to say why there is a kind of uh, structural change in our way of producing energy necessary in order to... Um, yeah, to avoid uh, further stress uh, stress for the environment. And um, I think that's also in South Africa a very big issue. And uh, we all know, I think, that uh, they have a lot of power outages and power cut. And then to say, um, don't rely anymore about your um, um, power stations, which are working with the uh, coal, go more to renewable energy. I mean that's from outside easily said, but for the people means it's mean that for a certain while perhaps uh, enormous hardship. So you have to um, let's say to really to 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 give a full perspective what has to be done. And I think one important thing is that South Africa mean uh, needs uh, in that case much more support from the international community to go uh, further to uh, um, change to. Uh, renewable energies and to wind energy, for example, which is really and solar energy, both is very um, available in in uh, South Africa. And there are certain steps, and I think that's important that they should be um, reported. For example, I think European Union um, allocated about eight billion euros to South Africa to develop the um, um, renewable energy, but. Uh, that's, for example, something which should be incorporated into a, um, a constructive story on that. But um, it's a very broad field and it needs always a certain kind of complexity which has to be covered. Good. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I think we're already a great, bit great. over the time. Hmm? Yeah, actually, I wanted to say that uh, we have two minutes to the end of your time. But uh, if you, you can probably have a conclusive uh, um, uh, statement before we invite the next speaker, you can have the pleasure of inviting the next speaker, uh, Christopher. 